uh, Jonas in, the director of LL. We're so glad um, that you're all here with us um, as we prepare to commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day. In um, 2005, the United Nations um, designated tomorrow, um, January 27th, as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, they chose the date to mark the liberation of the um, Auschwitz-Birkenau camps um, and to honor the victims of Nazism. So we're here today on the eve um, of Holocaust Remembrance Day to hear um, a different story but a special st and a special story uh, of liberation. So let me say um, three things, um, because I know that no one came here to hear me speak. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here. It uh, means a tremendous amount to be gathered. Um, people from diverse backgrounds to mark this important moment um, and to commemorate this important period in human history. Um, thank you to our sponsors, to the Norman and Irma Brandon Chair for Holocaust Studies, the Center for Jewish Studies, to the Jewish Council of North Central Florida, to Gamers for Israel, Holocaust Remembrance Month, Jewish Student Union, Stand With Us, um, and UF Hillel. Uh, and finally, uh, thank you to Bernice for being here, um, to be our teacher, um, and to help us um, learn once more from this um, vitally uh, significant period in human history, um, and hopefully to allow this learning to shape our own uh, course in life and our own actions moving forward. Um, so it's now my pleasure um, to introduce and to really to welcome um, to the University of Florida the inaugural Harry Rich Chair uh, for Holocaust Studies, um, Natalia Axion, who will introduce our speaker today. who is the author of this amazing book that uh, you can purchase today if you haven't yet uh, read it. Uh, and Bernice is uh, author, educator. And in Europe, there's a term that is not so used in, in the States, I think, public intellectual. And she truly is public intellectual. Uh, this book is incredibly researched, rich, profound, moving, and extremely original in how it's, it sets the story of uh, liberation uh, of, um, of uh, Bergen-Belsen. And, uh, and it's a personal story. It, it's a scholarly story. It's an academic story. Uh, so I very much look forward to Bernice sharing her uh, reflections, but also we'll have time for discussion and for questions after. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Natalia, and thank you, Rabbi Zinn, and thank you to all of you for coming here this evening. Does anyone know why the date of the liberation of Auschwitz was chosen by the UN to be International Holocaust Remembrance Day? It was. It was the liber. It was also. Almost everybody has heard of, have, has, have everyone, has everyone here heard of Auschwitz, right? It was the most notorious, the biggest camp symbolizing this industrialized killing where nearly two million people were killed. It was just part of the story of the Holocaust. But it seems a little strange to me, um, and that is because in January of 1945, when Auschwitz was liberated, my mother was still in a slave labor camp. And she was not going to be liber liberated for several more months. And I'm here now to tell you a little bit about the story of the liberation of, of Bergen-Belsen, which was, at the time, the largest, that had the largest number of surviving inmates of the Holocaust. So uh, thank you so much, Natalia, for your kind words about my book. So um, I, I wrote this book, All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, a British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen-Belsen. At the same time I published it, it, right before the pandemic broke, or at the time, um, it was published simultaneously in the UK, and they had a d completely different, they had, it's the same text, same images, but they had a different concept for the cover. But I wanted you to see both, because both tell a story of my two protagonists. I decided to tell the story of my mother's 
rescue as a, a race against time story. Race against time. Where was she and where were the British allied forces in the last year of the war, from the spring of 1944 to the spring of 1945? Where are both and how did it come, how, how actually was my mother's life saved? Like, why am I here? Like, how, how she was on the brink of death and how did she survive? So that became the driving question behind my research. So the, I, I tell the story, I tell the history, but I tell it through the story of individuals, two, my two protagonists. And one is my mom, and here she is, you can see she's standing in full. This is about seven months at the, after the end of the war. She's 16 years old, and you can see that she's well nourished by this point. Um, she had been very emaciated, but you, can, but you can see sort of here the sad expression in her eyes. She's not this jubilant, free, liberated person, right? She's 16 years old. She lost her four younger siblings and her parents and her grandmother in Auschwitz. A lot of her community was destroyed. She had nothing. Thing. She was orphaned, and here she is in a tuberculosis sanitarium in Arvika, slow, snowy northwest Sweden, where she is really very, very sick for a very long time. And here you see this rather startled man. This is Brigadier Glyn Hughes, H.L. Glyn Hughes, who spearheaded the liberation of Auschwitz. And here you get a better image of where he is sitting when he's startled by the cameraman in his caravan on the premises of, of Bergen-Belsen. And he was very high up in the hierarchy. He was, at this point, Deputy Director of Medical Services for the entire British Second Army when he came upon this death camp. So how was I going to tell the story of these two people? So like I said, I focused on one year, the last year of the war, the four seasons and the fifth season, the point at which the liberator and the deathly ill inmate are in the same place at the same time. It's The meat of the book is sandwiched between the Belzen trial because that was really significant. It, uh, there, and there's some interesting in details that set the scene and that close the book. And um, here is an image from Army Talks magazine in November 1945 of the makeshift courtroom in Lüneburg, Germany, about an hour and a half north of Bergen-Belsen. And this was the first trial after the war to apply international law to war crimes trials, immediately preceding the Nuremberg trials, which you may have heard of, and Glenn Hughes was the first witness. So in the book I talk about what his testimony is. He is setting the tone in a way for these war crimes trials. And here is the notorious Irma Grazi among sitting among those who are being prosecuted. And just to let you know that there were only 45 Nazis from Auschwitz, from Bergen-Belsen, that were brought to, brought to trial. They were actually brought to trial on charges of crimes they committed both in Bergen-Belsen and in Auschwitz-Birkenau from where they had come. There were 480 uh, Nazi functionaries working in Bergen-Belsen at the time of its liberation. So that gives you an idea of how many, just in this particular camp, got away. So 45, were, 45 out of 480 were brought to trial. 80 SS officers remained at the camp for the transfer, which I'll tell you about. And then I sandwich it further between a prologue and an epilogue where I get to tell some really significant stories, both about my mother's life and about Glenn Hughes before and after the war. So I'm going to now give you just a few things along the timeline of that year. I'm just going to point to a couple of dates. So here is where Glenn Hughes starts out in the Yorkshire Wolds. At this point, in the spring of 1944, he is Director of Medical Services for the British Army's 8th Corps, which goes on to see some of the most vicious fighting when they land in Normandy, which is my second point that I'm going to tell you just a little bit about. And here's Siget over here, which is where my mom is from. You may be familiar with Elie Wiesel. Is anyone familiar with Elie Wiesel? So he was her neighbor, and he, she was from Siget. And in the spring of 1944, she's, she, her parents are preparing for the Passover holiday, and she's sitting down at the Seder table with her family. No, you know, 
she was protected as a child. She's kind of sheltered. She's 14 years old. And right after Passover, the Jews in her hometown are ghettoized. And I tell the story of what that experience was like for her. I'm going to then point out just what happens on June 6th, the landing, and where my mom is, the landing of the Allied forces in the, on the coast of Normandy. And then I'm going to focus on what happens in Bergen-Belsen. So I'm going, to, I'm going to also give you some things that aren't exactly in the book. Certainly a lot of these images, I have different ones in the book. So why was Glenn Hughes in the Yorkshire Worlds? This is where the British Army practiced. They practiced, and in his case, they practiced because it was supposedly resembling the topography of Normandy. But he wasn't, they weren't really prepared for the hedgerows there that were brutal for the, for the um, fighting forces. But what his practice entailed was setting up and taking down regimental aid posts, casualty clearing stations. Everything was timed because they would have to be mobile in Europe. They'd have to be able to get to soldiers, get them to a place where they could be, their wounds could be treated, where they could have the necessary surgery, and evacuated to, to hospitals. So everything was very meticulous. A lot of planning went into it, and Glenn Hughes was a stalwart for planning. He was uh, extremely measured and and everybody had to know what they were doing. He took no nonsense from anyone and he it was his group his eighth corps was the most well trained corps. Um, of course uh, what happened is that he's quite surprised and when he comes to Bergen Bilson, but that's fast forwarding. So that's where he is um, and I will now tell you just show you a little image of where my mom is. So my mom grew up, actually she was born in Romania. Sigit is up here, and it was part of Romania. But in 1940, the Hungary was awarded this area, northern Transylvania, by, by the Germans, by Hitler. And so for her, as a kid, she's 10 years old, and she's in school, and it's kind of crazy making. So one day, school is uh, Romanian school, and the next day, all the Romanian teachers are gone. There's Hungarian teachers there. And if you speak a word of Romanian, you get fined. So it was, it was crazy. But it was, it was um, not as crazy as, it, as I paint it. Because the truth is that her parents were raised under Hungary's times around World War I. And they were familiar. They knew Hungarian. So she knew a little bit of Hungarian. And... It was, it was crazy for other reasons. But anyway, um, I have, sadly, not a single photograph of my grandparents. I don't know what they look like. I don't have any pictures of my mom's uh, siblings or her when she was a child. Nothing survived, and I've tried. But um, I, I do, I did practically torture her all my growing up years and plumbing her memory. And at one point, she sat down and she drew a map of her neighborhood and her chart and where she lived. And I actually went to Siget, not with her, but I went with my sister in a group right before the pandemic. And it was a town of maybe 30,000, 40% of whom were Jewish. So it had a very Jewish flavor, like the Sabbath, the Shabbat. Like you could walk into any Jewish home and there'd be a white tablecloth and candlesticks. But none of that exists now, right? The Jews are gone from Siget. And so that's all gone. And I couldn't quite picture it the way she, the way it was. But to me, even though the streets now have Romanian names, this was Timar Utsa, which was her address. And this was Kigyo Utsa, where the Jews had to line up from her area, from the ghetto, to be marched to the synagogue and then to the train station. And this is where Elie Wiesel lived, right over here. And it was like a few minute walk from there to where my mom's apartment would have been, which was over here on this like strip. She was from a poor family. They didn't have a house of their own. They had a small apartment with six children. It was quite crowded. And she would tell me about all her adventures growing up in this, in this area. And here was the Talmud Torah, the synagogue, somewhere around here where her, parent, her father went and where Ellie Wiesel's father went. But the mountains didn't move, right? And the streets with different names didn't move. So I could more or less walk and try to trace the path. How long was it from her house to this synagogue, to that synagogue, to the train station? I could kind of try to picture. 
So June 6, now skipping to June 6, 1944. My mom had already been in Auschwitz, Birkenau for about three weeks. Um, I described the shocking journey in my book and here the British land on the coast of Normandy. This is a magnificent invasion, an arm armada of 150,000 allied troops land on five beaches here and um, and now they have to fight their way in, 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 and finally breaching the fortress of Germany. But what's really significant about this is that on June 6th, 1944, 4,414 Allied troops are killed in this terrible battle. Most of them Americans, more than 2,000 Americans, and a lot on, you know, Omaha Beach. What is really significant is that more than twice the number are killed that day on June 6, 1944 in Auschwitz-Birkenau. More than twice the number of human beings are killed that day. Moreover, every day after the D-Day invasion, while the battles were fierce, while there was terrible casualties and deaths, the number decreased. Whereas here, a whole summer long, with the deportation of the Jewish people from the Hungarian provinces, the last unmolested mass of Jews to be taken away during the Holocaust in rapid fire killing mode, there were twice the number. There was nine to 10,000 people killed there every, every day, every day after June 6th for the whole summer long. And we have something very, um, very, very valuable and very rare. There were, right, what photography, who could take pictures in Auschwitz, who could survive. So there's a very few, there's a very few photographs to document the killing process. But we do have this album that was found by a survivor, Lily Jacob, and it's called the Auschwitz Album. And if you have a chance, you could look it up. It had like 193 photographs in there. And they were, it was, they were taken by one of two SS men who were in charge of the photographic unit who did do some IDing of certain inmates who were meant to stick around for a while. Anyway, they, they documented, they documented how the killing process went. And here was a transport, like my mom's transport, also from the Hungarian provinces, during the summer of, spring and summer of 1944, where the ovens were outfitted with new parts, where the gas chambers were ready to receive this bulk of Jewish Jews and, and to kill them in this factory style. And here, this transport arrived maybe, maybe I think a, a few days, a couple of days after my mother's transport. So my mom arrived in Auschwitz on May 17th or 18th. This was somewhere around that time. And the photographer, you can think about what the photographer was trying to show. He was trying to maybe show the higher ups how it was done, how they masked people, how they came off. But there is some unintended testimony if you zoom in and look at the people. And you could see like a mother, a, a mother or a grandmother turning to a child and you could see a man talking to this other man, where are we? Like where have we arrived? Like what is this place? What is this planet? And you can just zoom in and look at the, at the Interactions. Now, Lily Jacob, the woman who found it, she was really sick at the end of the war, and she was in a camp called Dora Mittelbau in Germany, a concentration camp, and she was rummaging around after the liberation to find something to eat, something to wear, and she found this album in a drawer in a Nazi officer's room. And she, this is of her transport. Like, what are the odds of this? This is just unbelievable. So I don't have pictures of it, but a couple of the pictures are of her brothers, of her, herself. She sees her grandmother in them, which is incredible. And she, she realized it was valuable. She's li she was living here somewhere in Florida, in the South. She was working as a waitress. Like, she had this very valuable document. She was convinced to turn it over to Yad Vashem, but even when she turned it over to Yad Vashem, some of the pictures were missing. 
Why? Because she, her fellow survivors saw one of their family members and she gave it to them. She, some pictures, she gave some pictures away. So here's more pictures and this to me is like among the saddest. These are the people who were not selected, you know, on the ramp at Auschwitz, Mengele and other doctors and industrialists were selecting people to live or to die, to go to the gas chamber or to be put aside for, for temporarily because they were needed. In the summer of 1944, they were needed for the war effort. They were needed, they had a loss of person power and they needed people to work in the, in the factories. They needed free slave labor, which is how, if you know anyone who survived Auschwitz-Birkenau, chances are that is how they were survived. They were picked for slave labor. And they were young and they were strong. Most of them were in their late teens, early 20s some early 30s. So here you have these people who are selected for the gas chamber and this is actually on the way to the gas chamber and here are women who were selected to work and my mother would look at this picture and she would say oh they were lucky because they had kerchiefs, they were given kerchiefs, she had nothing on her head and some of her hard labor involved being the sun beating down on her as she was chopping rock for a road. And this picture here is of a place called Canada. Canada was where all the stuff that people brought in on the cattle trains and the cattle wagons was gathered in this huge storage rooms. And it was all had to be sorted and anything worthwhile was shipped back to the Third Reich. Um, and I once said to my mother, I once said, because if you visit Auschwitz, you'll see behind like a glass display case, you'll see a pile of suitcases. And I actually spotted my friend's father's suitcase, Freitag. And I said, my, it was like really big letters on the suitcase, like big white letters. And she said to me, what do you think we were going to fancy Kennedy Airport? Like people brought things that were valuable to them for home and they didn't want them to get lost in the shuffle and they all were placed in Canada, a vast place because Canada, it was a vast country. And if they were picked to work in Canada, if you were picked to work sorting things, you were already very lucky. Although it was right in the vicinity of the gas chambers. So now skipping to what's going on, what's going on on Glen Hughes, and I'm just going to show you just a couple of the slides from the archives I was working in when I was doing research. And just to give you an idea of the kinds of things the Allies were thinking about as they were fighting their way in, and the kind of things he was consumed with. So here's a chart that tells, says D-Day, D plus one, D plus two, D plus three, D plus four. How many people, how many Neptune Beach casualties how many, um, how many drowned, how many were wounded, and he was keeping a track. He arrived himself on D plus six, and I tell the dramatic story of his landing on the shores, and how he had to commandeer hospitals in whatever area, how many beds there were in these hospitals in Brussels and Antwerp, and what kind of special units had to become, neurosurgical units, maxillofacial units, and how he had to organize all mastermind this whole medical rescue services for the fighting soldiers. And here's just another um, image from his albums, just some pictures of what it was like and sort of the British humor. Between these points your enemy lies and he, like you, can use his eyes. So show no light and he won't get wise. And as they're marching in, as they're liberating towns, and here as they cross over to the town of Lingen, they cross the fortress into Germany. Here these German soldiers are finally surrendering to them. But these and more pictures are in his albums. So now I'm going to uh, skip to um, what was really going on in Europe. I showed you some pictures of Europe in the spring, summer of 1940. Four, and now what happens, International Holocaust Commemoration Day commemorates the liberation of Auschwitz, January 27, 1945. But here's why that date was, to me, it's a, I understand why it was chosen and, and Auschwitz was notorious and it was really important, but the actual liberation of, libera of Auschwitz was really much, much smaller in scale than the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. So I'll explain to you why. In mid-January, there were about 60,000 inmates in Auschwitz, in Auschwitz-Birkenau. 
they were marched away from the camp. And this is where you hear about death marches. The whole idea was get the surviving inmates away from the liberating forces. No one should fall alive into allied hands. This was Hitler's order. Nobody should fall alive. So we're, we don't know what to do with them. We can't kill them fast enough. We, it's just the gas chambers are, were, one of them was blown up and uh, there was an act of resistance where the inmates, the Sonder Commando, who worked in the vicinity of the gas chambers, planned for months and months and they were able to blow up a gas chamber. None of them who were a part of this action survived. But there was fewer and fewer transports coming in to Auschwitz. Birkenau. Most of the killing had been done. Even before, before the, I told you about the Hungarian deportation, by that time, 90% of Polish Jewry had already been killed in other death camps in Sobibor and Treblinka. And so here, January already, 1945, there's about 60,000 remaining inmates in Auschwitz. Gas chambers can't, can't handle this anymore. They don't know how to kill that many people that fast. They start to march them away. March them away in the bitter cold of winter without adequate clothing, footwear, barely any food, and they march them, I'll show you basically, in two directions. So by the time the Russians come to, to, come to liberate, Auschwitz I has only about 1,200 inmates only. It's a lot, but still, it's not the mass numbers that we see at other places. Auschwitz II, Birkenau, is where the mass killing and the four gas chambers were where they killed all the Hungarian Jew, the Jews from the provinces, 5,800 are left. 600 are left in Auschwitz II, Auschwitz III, which is Buna, which is a synthetic rubber plant, so where they had some slave laborers working. So it was, kind, it was fewer than 8,000 people were remaining in Auschwitz on the day of its liberation, January 27th, 1945. And here's some pictures that the Russians took at the time of the liberation. This is, these are the ovens. And this is a quite famous picture because there were still children there who had been experimented on by Mengele. But it's really kind of um, ironic, maybe, that the people who were remaining in Auschwitz were those who were too sick to be to go on the death march. So Primo Levi, he writes about it, he writes about his um, remaining days there. I wrote about it in another book about, I profile a, a little boy who was 10 years old who was there at this time. So those who really could not march out were the ones who were remaining. And here you see just piles of things that were found. And you could just imagine like one leather shoe who that belonged to. and clothes and spectacles and just the volume, massive, massive amount of stuff. And there was a hospital there to treat. They did, the Russians did set up and they tried to treat the inmates who were so sick. So being marched out of Auschwitz, so here's Auschwitz, and there were basically two directions. I think it was 30 miles this way, 35 miles this way, people were marching. And they were deposited in camps away from the liberators as the liberators were coming. They could have been deposited in Flossenburg and Dachau and the largest number wound up here in Northwest Germany in Bergen-Belsen. My mother was in a Grossrosen camp. It was right near here when she was taken on a death march in, in the beginning of February marching, marching. Now they marched them, they could only march them so far and they would sleep on the road or I think, I actually think snow saved some people's lives that they could eat snow uh, or they sometimes they after they were marching they put them in these cattle wagons and to move them faster. They would be shunted aside for railroad trains for the army but they would slowly move, move, move deep into northwest Germany, away from the liberators. And I think they ate lice off each other. I mean, they had nothing to eat. So here you have, here you have people who were young and strong, and they evaded the gas chambers in Auschwitz, and they survived brutal slave labor camps where they were needed for the war effort, and they survived the death march. And they wind up in a place with like Bergen-Belsen. Now I should just say that in January of 1945, there was about 
an estimated 715,000 of these survivors, these most of, mostly slave laborers, Jewish slave laborers, and at least 250,000 died on the death march. People were shot on the road. If you couldn't keep up, if you had to go to the bathroom, anything, if you just stumbled, you were shot. That, those were the orders given to the Wehrmacht who were guarding the walkers. So, this is a really truth is stranger than fiction story because three weeks before the end of the war, before May 8th, Victory in Europe Day, three weeks before the war is over, Himmler decides to hand Bergen-Belsen over to the British and to the British Army. So this on, it's a really strange story. Part of it involves him being convinced by his masseuse to do this, so I'll let you read further about that. But him, this was against Hitler's orders, and this was committing treason. And on April 12th, some uh, military men from both the German side and the British side met and made this truce that they were going to hand over this camp. It was a matter of international health interests because you had in Bergen-Belsen all these people who had been dumped there without any facilities to care for them. The last five days, no food, no water. People were dying and people were suffering from three raging epidemics. Typhus, tuberculosis, gastroenteritis, plus every other disease known to humankind. So the Germans didn't know how to handle the situation. It was out of, so way out of control. There were no gas chambers here in Bergen-Belsen. It was a different type of camp and it had really morphed in the past year to when it became this sort of dumping ground and so they decided to hand it over to the British. So part of the truce was they had to erect a danger typhus signs everywhere and this image here of the camp, there was five compounds on one side, two on the other, the men and women were separated and my mother by this point had been in Bergen-Belsen for a month already. She had arrived in March 15th, 1945. And those who were there for really any length of time were barely alive. The most of the people you found, the British found, who were in relatively better shape at the end of the war had arrived within the previous week because it was an impossible situation. So April 12th, the day that the truce is signed between the Germans and the British, the SS in the camp decide they want to have this clean up, this effort to neaten the place up because there were corpses lying everywhere. There was in the huts, people were dying. The job of the people who were, were still okay was to bring them outside. They, a wagon came around and collected the, the dead people, the corpses. but. It, the numbers became so overwhelming. There was 55 to 60,000 people there. When Glenn Hughes came in, he made a really quick assessment that turned out to be very accurate. He thought, he said 25,000 of these people need immediate medical attention. And out of those 25,000, I doubt that I can save 14,000. So he, it was just, a real problem. So, uh, but I want to just tell you about this picture and what it reminds me of. So, um, <clears throat> downstairs in the basement with my mom, I'm like 14 or 15 years old. I'm the age she was when she went through these experiences. We don't know the word Holocaust. I, we just, you know, we talk about the war, what happened during the war. And I used to watch her iron, and I just used to sit there and just watch her iron, and she would tell me stories. She'd tell me about her life in Siget. She'd tell me about her post-war life in Sweden. And one day she's telling me about Auschwitz, and then she's telling me about Bergen-Belsen. And she compares them. She says, Auschwitz was terrible, but Bergen-Belsen was worse. And this is, you know, it's hard to say this to people because Auschwitz was macabre, like the gas chambers were going day and night. But in Auschwitz you saw people in healthy form who had come straight from their homes. In Bergen-Belsen she already saw, they called them muzzle men, skeletons, people with just skin and bones who were really just shadows of them former selves. You couldn't, you couldn't recognize your brother or your father or your uncle. The men were, the men were already so skeletal. So what they did, what the 
Nazis did is they decided to clean up the camp so they were going to have the inmates who were still ambulatory, who could still walk, drag the other, the dead, to a mass grave at the end of this road. And my mother, I'm, stand, I'm in the laundry room with her, and she puts down the iron, and she demonstrates for me. She takes a couple of steps away from the ironing board, she leans forward, she stretches her arms out behind her, and she demonstrates how she, who was 50% dead, had to drag people to their mass grave at the end of this road. And she was with her sister, her older sister, and she turned to her sister and she said, look, this girl has her mouth open and her eyes open. I think she, and that, her sister said, that's because she really wanted to live. And my mother said, we all want to live, but I don't think we will. And some of the people, she did tell me, were still breathing when, she, when they had to do this. So here's what the British found, and in this largest camp count, compound, they called it the horror camp pretty quickly. I'm not going to show you really close-up images, but I'm just going to show you some things just to give you a little bit of a sense. It's really hard to get a sense. but. The SS officers, I mentioned, they remained 80, uh, remained in the camp for the transfer. And here you see survivors. They called them, the British called them displaced persons because they didn't know where they were from, right? Glenn Hughes was amazed. We have people here from Czechoslovakia, from France, from Germany, from Greece, from Poland, from, you know, all over Europe, Romania, Hungary. These are the DPs who are surviving and they're jeering at the SS officers who are forced to help in the cleanup. Because the cleanup that my mother had to be part of didn't last very long. It lasted a couple of days because people were falling down dead on the job. So here you have the British Tommies have their guns trained on the SS officers who have to help with the cleanup. And here you see Rabbi Leslie Hardman, who's a chaplain who came in with the British Second Army. And he is bereft at the way people are being buried helter-skelter in these mass graves. He actually appeals to Glenn Hughes about that, which I talk about in the book. But you have this 12 foot deep, 20 to 30 feet wide, 40 to 50 or 60 feet long, and this is how people had to be buried. And then they had to do this. And then in Glenn Hughes gave the order, and here they gave markers, grave number two, 5,000. Well, I can tell you that if you went to Bergen-Belsen today, it's really, a really well done uh, sort of memorial, museum, and there's nice big um, uh, tombstones, monuments, saying 10,000 people buried here, 2,000 buried here, 5,000 buried here. But I can tell you, that it was really just guesswork. They really don't know. It could have been way more people. And this you'll find on bergen Belsen if you go to visit. It's a tombstone for Margot and Anne Frank. I calculate Anne Frank probably died, uh, uh, she, I think, end of January. She died um, shortly before my mother got there. She was a little bit older than my mother. And this is a marker, grave marker, but I can tell you that this is not where she's buried. She's in one of these mass graves. And this I wanted to point out. Here is one of the DPs, the survivors, with a big square cut out of the back of her coat. And this is, she came from a slave labor camp. And they were working in the winter, and they wanted the slave laborers to produce. <coughs> so they gave them some minimal food and they gave them some clothes from the transports from Auschwitz and they but they cut a big square out of the backs of the coats or they put a re big red X on them so they should be easily identifiable less as halfling as prisoners lest they try to escape thank you Natalia <laughs> And here's some more images, and you can see how these women who were scavenged for potatoes, which is a whole big story because the British did not right away, um, well, the British right away, the British soldiers, the British Tommies felt enormous sympathy and revulsion, and they got sick, and they were throwing up, and they were furious, and they were angry, and the first thing they did was give their rations, their rations to the inmates. So, P.S., 2,000 inmates died 
of uh, sickness from eating their first meal because those rations were heavy. They were spam or they were chocolate. They were all kinds of things that the people with shriveled intestines couldn't handle. So they had to like, there was times when they had to run into the barracks saying, don't eat, don't eat. And Glenn Hughes had to carefully work up diets for people in various stages of emaci emaciation and hope that they got carried out. So how they fed the inmates, what kind of food they gave them, what they experimented with in terms of trying to bring starved people back to life is uh, quite complicated. But here these women scavenge for, uh, for potatoes and you can see that they are cooking them and they're completely inured to the scene in the background and to the smells. And here <clears throat> on the third day after the liberation, the um, British 11th Light Field Ambulance comes in and pitches a dump of tentage. Why tents? To get people out of these huts. They called these barracks huts. And they were very overcrowded. The living were sleeping on the dead and it was there was absolutely one mass of human excreta on the floor. It was a her it was beyond description. I can't describe it. I can only tell you what I've read. So they pitched these tents to get people out of the huts who could still walk so they could get maybe a sip of water to someone in the huts because it was very overcrowded. And this may look like nothing to you, these photographs, but they're very significant to me because what was the distance from the tent to the hut? From the tent to the hut? Because my mother, at one point, she was, went into a tent and she was expelled from the tent after a few days and had to crawl back to the hut. And there are, you know, you think the liberators come and there's order and there's freedom and there's joy, but it was very, very chaotic. And there were a lot of things that happened on the ground behind the scenes. And my mother was severely beaten up by her compatriots back in the hut. So here are some images um, <clears throat> from what happened. The water, the SS, before they left the camp, they sabotaged the water. So the Royal Engineers had to come in and figure out a way to pump water into the camp. Glenn Hughes ordered the, um, neighbor, the neighboring citizens and the mayors of the neighboring towns to come see what their countrymen had wrought. And then the rescue. How were they going to attempt to save this many people? What kind of triage would give the best chance for the most people? And I can tell you that I cho one of the reasons I chose um, to write about Glenn Hughes is he's one of these sort of unsung heroes of the Holocaust. He should be as widely known, I think, as like an Oscar Schindler because he had real moral motivation. His first thing when he came in was, we're going to try to save as many lives as possible. But to figure out how to do that, they had to really, really pull all the resources they had, which wasn't that much. Battles were still raging in Northwest Germany. His men were, his men were taking care of the the troops and he had to figure out with limited help how to how to do it so they decided ultimately after a couple of days and it took about it took like longer than a week to put this into action they were going to have something called the human laundry luckily they found a cavalry stables about a mile and a half from the camp and they outfitted it with 60 tables they pulled in some german nurses from the area right they didn't have other other personnel. Here's some British supervisors. But you can imagine how some of these inmates felt being taken care of and washed by German nurses, but they were being supervised. And these men in like, I don't know, hazmat kind of suits, they had to protect themselves. Everyone who came into the place had to be sprayed with DDT because of the typhus. And they went hut by hut and a medic marked someone's forehead with a red X on ch with chalk if they thought in like a split second they had to make a decision. If they thought they had a chance at surviving, they would evacuate them to these makeshift hospital rooms. So here's, they're evacuating people from the huts, these men, and they're taking them in a contaminated ambulance because they're taking them to the human laundry and after they are sponged down, cleaned, heads shaven again sometimes, DDT sprayed all over them, find a clean blanket to wrap around them. 
where are you going to find 14,000 blankets? Like the logistics of this was really difficult. And then take them to a clean hospital room in a clean ambulance. So they had to, it took a, it took a good, I don't know, it took like maybe 20, it took seven days, it took at least a week to put this into action. And this was going on for quite a while. And I calculated, based on some stories my mother told me, that she probably was one of the first to be evacuated to the hospital. But she has a whole dramatic story around that. But I'm going to read you from the bottom, OK? So first of all, I want to say that Glenn Hughes was recognized for his humanity and his kindness by some of the survivors. Some of them emerged as leaders and helpers to him. And they named the hospital the Glenn Hughes Hospital. And 14,000 patients were in the Glenn Hughes Hospital, the largest such facility in Europe, on May 19, 1945, one month after the liberation. It took two weeks for the backlog of corpses to be buried in Bergen-Belsen. 500 former inmates died each day for a month after the liberation. 361 British Army soldiers and medical personnel worked in the relief of Bergen-Belsen two days after the liberation, and that's a very small number that he was able to get to help. 750 to 1,000 sick were processed each day for over three weeks after liberation at the Human Laundry, the place for washing and disinfecting survivors. And there were 25,000 who were deemed fit. And that meant they could walk up like a truck, they could walk up three steps. And they were deemed, OK, you're OK. So they were sent to a different transit and rehabilitation barracks. And it was kind of fungible, like some of the fit became sick, and some of the sick became, could eventually go there. And it was not until May 21st that, it, remember, Victory in Europe Day was May 8th. Glenn Hughes was not about to celebrate then. Not until May 21st was he going to celebrate the victory and race, hoist the Union Jack, the British flag. And finally, here he is, Glenn Hughes. He gives the order. There's a big ceremony on May 21st when they torch the last barrack. Every time a barrack was evacuated, it had to be burned down. Why? Why are there no barracks or huts there anymore? disease, because of the disease. And it was a big moment. This little country off the coast of Sri Lanka, the Maldives, issued these commemorative stamps at the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. And one of the stamps was of inmates and British troops burned last hut at Belzen. And here you see an effigy of Hitler and the Iron Cross. And that's the actual photo. So this man, Lieutenant Colonel Mervyn Gonin, commander of the 11th Light Field Ambulance, worked very closely with Glenn Hughes. And this just gives you um, a little taste of what went on and, and, right in the days and weeks after. It was shortly after the British Cross arrived, though it may have no connection, that a very large quantity of lipstick arrived. This was not at all what we men wanted. We were screaming for hundreds and thousands of other things, and I don't know who asked for lipstick. I wish so much that I could discover who did it. It was the action of genius, sheer, unadulterated brilliance. I believe nothing did more for these internees than the lipstick. Women lay in bed with no sheets and no nighty, but with scarlet red lips. You saw them wandering around about with nothing but a blanket over their shoulders, but with scarlet red lips. So I leave it to you to think about why. What did this lipstick do for these people who lost their, you know? So now, if I have, do I have another a little bit more time? So now I'm going to tell you about a little chapter, the immediate post-war chapter that my mom wasn't really part of. My mom was very, very sick with TB. She was teetering between life and death. The Swedish government, in a humanitarian gesture, maybe for all sorts of reasons, decided to take in around 7,000 of the sickest survivors from Bergen-Belsen to rehabilitate them. They had in mind that they would come, they would treat them for their illnesses, and six months they'd be going home to their home countries. 
this, my mother was in Sweden. She was in and out of TB sanatoriums for 10 years in Sweden. So it didn't happen exactly like that. And it didn't happen like that for most people. But anyway, those who remained in Bergen-Belsen, the young, the strong 20s, 30s, remember my mother was only 15. Those who were older, um, and if they were in good shape, they stayed in Bergen-Belsen in what became a very vibrant displaced persons camp. The British only wanted them to be repatriated. Go home, the war's over, go to your home countries. But very often there was no home to go back to, no community to go back to. It depends on where in Europe. So anyway, 420 men and 300 women who had been married and did not know the fates of their spouses were granted permission to remarry. Right? You don't know what happened. These young people, some of them had been married before the war. They had spouses. They don't know what happened to their spouse. So what happens in this DP camp? They're pairing up. They lost so many relatives. They're looking to have families. They're looking to have someone in their life to create a new, to create life anew. That drive was so strong. And so there had to be a special Jewish marriage contract for people who who had been married, who wanted to get married again. So the rabbis drew up this contract allowing for some material provisions should your former spouse somehow show up, which could happen years later. And here you had one of the largest baby booms in history in the Bergen-Belsen displaced persons camp. And it sounds like a silver lining, but if you really listen to the individual stories, it's way more complicated than that. There was so much loss. But the life, but people, the drive to recreate was incredible. Way more babies were born in the DP camp than to the Frau line in the surrounding countryside in Germany, in the whole of Germany. And so here you had uh, the life in a few years revolved around these small children with a kindergarten. And here you have these pictures of children, children slowly populating the camp. And you had a lot of resourcefulness. So sometimes, you know, there were more weddings in Bergen-Belsen that year after the war than anywhere else. Like every day there was, there was several marriages a day. People were getting married. And Glenn Hughes actually wrote about that, about going to the first, he was invited to some of the weddings and the first one he went to. And here's a woman who is determined, some people were just wore a white blouse and a black skirt, but she wanted to have a wedding dress. So her husband, her fiance worked in the canteen and he traded like two cans of coffee beans and some cigarettes for a parachute that a German had, a German soldier had no use for. And someone fashioned for her this beautiful wedding dress. And this woman's name was Gina Turgell and she was called the Bride of Bells and she wound up marrying a British Tommy, a British soldier. And he found a British parachute and had this gorgeous dress made for her. So this dress is hanging in the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, and this dress is hanging in the Imperial War Museum in London. And this girl, she's 19 years old in this picture, she found on the ground like two sticks, and she found some uh, German army officer's socks, and she unraveled the socks and knit herself this sweater, this beautiful sweater. So these people, who are survivors, I can't generalize, but I can tell you from the ones I know, they could do anything with anything. They very resourceful. So there was um, some talented people among the survivors, and they performed. They, they uh, set up a kazet, a concentration camp theater, and here they are performing immediate, like past experiences are being performed on stage to audiences of 2,000 who are just bawling their eyes out because it's like, mommy, mommy, you're being taken from me. So these are the performances, the very cathartic theater. And the Organization for Rehabilitation and Training comes to the camp trying to give people skills for their life that they hopefully will go to and establish somewhere. Sewing and these two people, these two pictures on the bottom are from a dental technician school and there's welding school. And because this camp at Bergen-Belsen, which was, had the largest number of inmates after the war and wound up being the largest displaced persons camp with 12,000 people in it, they needed their own Jewish police force. So here you see them. And here 
Here is like a birth certificate of someone who's giving birth to their second child in the Glenn Hughes Hospital. And here is um, a patient in the hospital who did a series of 11 drawings. And this really says so much. He labels, his, he writes in German, we survived, what now? And there was a beautiful um, magazine and that was produced in the nearby town of Sella. People started to express themselves. And, uh, this means Unzersteimer. I don't know how to pronounce it in German, but it means our voice. And it's still being produced today by a descendants of Bells and Survivors in Israel, and you can see it online. It's a beautiful magazine. And what happened to here was that there were some people some of the young survivors, they were maybe in their late 20s, early 30s, and they had been very actively involved in Zionist youth groups before the war, and they knew how to organize. They had those skills and those abilities. They had that training from before the war. And this man, Yussel Rosensaft, small in stature but giant personality, helped to organize these people in the Bells and DP camp. And they were united around a common goal. We have no home to go to. We have, we, we don't know, no, the gates are closed to us. In most countries, people are, we're not being allowed in. We need a place to go and to establish ourselves and to build a life. Open the gates of Palestine. Open the gates of Palestine. If there had been a Jewish homeland, we would not be prey to these forces. Open the gates of Palestine. So the, whether they were religious or secular, they were mobilizing around this idea of Palestine. These people, these young people, would eventually move to Palestine and set up their own kibbutz. And here is a visitor, a Jewish soldier from the Jewish Brigade who fought the Nazis in World War II. He comes to visit the camp, and people around him are like so excited to see a Jewish man in uniform. So now I'm going to play you, I'm going to play a video. This is, I'll try, I'll try, I'll try to get the video. This is a Yugoslavian POW who was trained as a rabbi. He's 32 years old. He's not 32 years old when he's giving his testimony, but he was 32 years old at the time when he went into Bergen-Belsen because he wanted to be of help. Let me see if I could. <laughs> מבלוק לבלוק, לראות מי נפטר, להוציא אותם ולקבור אותם. אבל מה, הייתה פקודה מאנגלים שאי אפשר קבר אחים לעשות בגלל המחלות, אלא קבר אחים. <קבר>, קבר אחים. <קבר> כולם יחד. <קבר> כלומר, שורה אחת, נגיד 20-30, על זה כן סיד, כן, ועל זה שוב כן איזה 30-20 וזה. כמו שהיה ב, ב, <coughs> במחנה המוות הזה, איפה שאלפים קינקים. אבל יום אחד ניגשה אליי אישה ואמרה לי, רבי, שמעתי היום שבבלוק הזה וזה, ביתי נפטרה. אז אמרתי, אז מה לעשות? אני רוצה קבר בשבילה, קבר יחיד. אמרתי, אבל זה בלתי אפשרי. אבל לכן אני מבקשת ממך. אז אמרתי לה, את יודעת מה? בלילה כשחיילים בדרך כלל, האנגלים, נמצאים במועדונים, אז אנחנו נגבור אותם. אנחנו נביא, נביא את הגופה, ואנחנו כן נגבור אותם. ובאמת, בלילה היא קמה מהמיטה, ואני ניסיתי מהר מהר לקבור אותה, קדיש להגיד, ופתאום כשאני רציתי כבר לסתום את הגולל, היא אומרת לי, רגע אחד רבי. והיא פנתה עם העיניים לשמיים ואמרה, ריבונו של עולם, ביידיש, אני מודה, אני מודה לך על הזכות הגדולה שנתת לי היום לקבור את ביתי במו ידיים. אמן. מרגע זה, אני מוכרח להגיד, נעשיתי אדם אחר. עשינו עכשיו את הכל על מנת לעזור לאנשים, כן, בדרך לחיים. 
ופה התחלנו לאשכול לדאוג, היו כמה ילדים לגן ילדים, ואחר כך להקים בית ספר, כן. פה עזרו לנו, לנו הרבה אנשי בריגדה שהגיעו כבר בזמן הזה, כן, לברגן בלזן גם כן. והקמנו כבר גם כן תיאטרון, כן. חיים חדשים התחילו, כן. ופה אני עסקתי עד 48', כן, פה בתורה, חתונות התחילו, כן, ברית מילות, כן, וכולי 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 וכולי. ואני לא צריך להדגיש כמה שאני הייתי מאושר. כל משפחה רצתה שבברית מילה שאני נתתי לכולם, חופה וקידושים, שאני אחזיק את הילד. היום המאושר ביותר בחיים שלי היה בילד האלף, כשאני החזקתי בידיים. הילד האלף. There were 2,000 babies. He said the thou he held the thousandth baby in his arms, who was, um, thank you, uh, for his um, circumcision. But so a thousand boys, there was a thousand girls, there were 2,000 babies born in the Glenn Hughes Hospital in the years after the war. And those people are now walking around this earth. Most of them, please God, are still with us. They're in their 70s. Yeah, they must be in their like, late 70s. And, um, They know that they were born at a very special place and time in history. And then I'm going to end the presentation here. Um, in my book, I have the epilogue and talk a little bit about my mom. And um, this is the most recent picture of her. Sadly, she died a few months ago. But she was giving her testimony to a lot of school groups. And here she is right after the war in Sweden. And here's Glenn Hughes at the time of the liberation. And you can see the sadness in his eyes. And, Him later, he was a great sportsman. And my parents, their wedding picture, and my dad was also a survivor. Here he is in a displaced persons camp. So thank you so much for listening. And I went over time, so I don't know if there's time for questions. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for sharing your story. And there, there's always time for questions. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. If, if folks have anything that they're interested in asking. Yes. How old was your mother when she died? 93. But there was a woman featured on the news just in the last month or so who was giving talks to groups until, I think, until the early 90s. She was a survivor. It probably was not your mom. No. Well, she was in New York. She was on Long Island. It was a person in New York? It could have been her. I mean, I don't know. She, she was written up in the Long Island newspaper, Newsday, yeah. Well, it's amazing that you're carrying on in, in, your, in your own way. Yeah, well, what was very fortunate was when I was writing the book, I, I had her with me, and I could, you know, send her chapter drafts or ask her questions so I could get some details, some more details from her as I was that made the writing richer, yeah. How many Germans SS were executed by the British at Bergen-Belsen? At, at Bergen-Belsen right after the liberation or at the trial? Oh, at the trial, 11, 11 were hung. 11, they, oh, including the hung down? Yeah. Oh, wonderful, good news. Just, <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Uh, obviously, um, dedicated, uh, your work as a memorial to those who were lost. Can you share a little bit about the impact of writing this on you? Obviously, uh, you've done a little bit of research, uh, maybe a lot of research to a few documents. Give us some background about how you prepared yourself to undertake the role of writing. Yeah. So first, my first book was about uh, seven Holocaust survivors who were not related to me. They weren't part of my family. And they were very different from anyone in my family. I had someone from France, someone from Germany, someone from Lithuania, completely different. And they all became academics in their post-war lives. And my parents were not from that background. They had very little formal schooling. And it took me a very, very long time to write about my mother. It was really hard. I couldn't really, 
it was really hard, like especially when I was when I was young, I was too young. I wrote like bits and pieces of things, but I didn't do ton, tons of research. But you know, when I had small children, it was really painful to think about being in the situation where I couldn't protect them. And that's one of the greatest sins of Nazism. Where, you know, my grandparents couldn't protect their younger, their kids. So it took me a long time, but um, the way I decided, the way, what helped me to do it was to sort of divorce myself from being my, the mother's daughter and look at her as this, who is this little girl going through these things? And try to, try to, it's really hard to look at your parents objectively, right? But I tried to separate myself and she had given me such, so many amazing stories over so many years and I just tried to take that and find out, just research the greater context, like what was she actually navigating and tell her story that way at a distance. So you won't find me in the book. Like a, a lot of second generations are writing their story. They're like, what was it like growing up as a parent? But I'm not in the book. I just kind of distance myself and just as if I'm telling the story of this little girl and what she's going through and what she experienced. And her words are, are in the book. Most, you know, she practically co-authored it with me, you know, so. Yes? How did your mom meet your dad? And how old was she when she got married? Yeah, so she was um, 25 when she got married, which was really good because um, a lot of marriages you saw were formed right after the war. And you had all kinds of crazy, you know, sometimes they worked out beautifully. There's really quite few divorces among survivors. But you had people from very different backgrounds getting married, right? So, you know, <laughs> but she waited. She had, was a kid. So she had to heal and she had to get well. My father was just... Um, he could have very easily have gotten married immediately after the war in DP camp, um, but he he also wanted to wait until he was more established. He didn't want to drag a woman around and a baby around Europe with him. He didn't know where he was going to be, so he was very thoughtful about it. And they met ten years after the war in Sweden. It was, he was in the United States, and there's a story about how he went to take a trip to Sweden and met her, and they married there. Yes. Okay, so um, you mentioned briefly that your mother wouldn't use the word Holocaust, and she said she used the word the war. Um, so I wanted to ask, was there a specific turning point in your upbringing where she became more open to talking about um, using the word the Holocaust, or just changing the narrative of what actually happened, and she was a little bit more transparent with her story and her, her history? So she didn't use the word Holocaust because the Holocaust word wasn't out there. It wasn't out there. Like I don't, I don't remember when the word Holocaust was coined. But certainly, we had a lot of conversations before we even knew the word. Like I remember when I went to college. I think I was the first, I was there was a course at my college. I went to Oneonta that was called anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, and the Jew today. Like it was just like it was just slowly. You know, it was that was in the early 1970s, late 1960s. But before then. It was just the war, and she was always open to talking about her past. It was, and I was a pretty um, relentless kind of kid. Like, you know, when I was six years old, and I didn't want to go to sleep, and I crawled down to the kitchen, and I could ask her questions. The longer I could ask her questions, the more she would talk and tell me stories. So, I it, we we had this pattern established from a very young age where. She would tell me about her past, which she had so many interesting things to share. And only when I was the age that she was, when she really went through the worst experiences, did she tell me what she had went through during the war. And, and then, so I had an outline, and I kept trying to fill it in, and fill it in, and fill it in, until I really got down every, you know, all parts of her experience before she was married. And I end it, I end the book when she gets her high school diploma, her high school equivalency in Sweden. Yes? What would you say your mom's hope is for the younger generation regarding someone's Jewish identity and the increasing rate of anti-Semitism? 
Oh, she would be very upset about uh, when she sees anti-Semitism. And she, when she spoke to school groups, she really spoke to group kids and she had a few messages for them. She would say, use your education to do good in this world. Always stand up for the underdog, for people who are suffering. Don't let anyone ever say, tell you the Holocaust didn't happen. If someone tells you the Holocaust didn't happen, spit in their eye. She was like, and, and um, she would also tell them that they should have hope if they go through really difficult times in their own life, um, if they suffer grave losses or setbacks in some way, that they should, oh, they should not give up, they should have hope because things can eventually turn around for them. Yes? Do you write anything about your father's story anywhere? I'm working on that now. <laughs> I'm working on his story, yeah. 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 Maybe less. I, I, I'm curious how your your mother responded to that book when it was already out or manuscript. Was it like you know you explained to her some aspects of her story with all the context and the archival research, or did she remain with her personal experience? She. <laughs> She was happy, you know, she was happy for me because she knew I worked so hard on it. And um, yeah, I think she was happy that it was recorded. I can, I'll tell you two things. I'll tell you that once I was working on drafts and we were in an airport, we, were, we took my mom to Alaska after my dad died on a cruise. And we're sitting in the airport and I give her a draft of the chapter about her last Passover with her family and what it was like. And she reads it and she starts crying and she's not very emotional. And then it's terrible to say, but then I knew that I got it. Like I knew that I got it right because it really touched her. And I'll tell you another thing. When the book first came out, she said to me, hmm, I might have said that a little differently, but I didn't want to correct you when I was reading your drifts because you just would have, it would just give you more work. <laughs> I thought, like, I have a word processor, mom. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, she didn't want to, so I'll just tell you those things. She just was very, she just didn't want me to work so hard. Don't work so hard. So. <laughs> Well, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, we're grateful for you being here, for being our teacher. Thank you. Uh, and for the important message that you've shared. Thank uh, you. The thank you. That, uh, just like um, you know, the, the rabbi at the end whose testimony you shared, uh, you know, you shared his desire to that his life should be um, a source of service to um, those who died. So too. And we all, like in our own way, seek through our own lives and our actions to um, both to bear witness and also to honor their memory, and on this day in particular. So thank you. Thank um, you. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the bookstore is here. Um, <laughs> and so if you're interested in learning more about this incredible story, um, they're here uh, to help. And I thank you all for being here. Um, thank you.